Welcome to KTVB Inside the Courtroom, the Vallow Trial. I'm Andrea Dearden, and we're glad you're here with us. We have had a week-long uh, process this week to seat the jury that will hear the case against Lori Vallow Daybell in court beginning on Monday, so next week. Um, we started with 1,800 mm -hmm. potential jurors, a huge pool. These are Ada County uh, citizens that were summoned to appear that mm -hmm. potentially could be jurors. That pool then narrowed down, uh, took several days to narrow it down mm -hmm. to 42, then down to 24, and eventually we landed on 18. What do we know about our jurors that we'll hear this case. Yeah, 18 uh, jurors from, and I want to back up really quickly, those 1,800 were folks that were given a questionnaire. So summoned for jury duty, they had to fill out a 20-page questionnaire, and it took a couple days for uh, the judge and the attorneys in the case, both the prosecution and the defense, to go through that questionnaire. You know, they could weed people out, whether they were going to be on vacation, whether it was very obvious they weren't going to serve on this jury. Uh, and then from there, we don't actually know how many they ended up with out of that 1,800 to begin this week of questioning. But they went through uh, extensive questioning yeah. from, you know, 8 or 9 in the morning until sometimes 6, 6.30 in the evening, mm -hmm. Monday through Thursday. Uh, and then they did something today called peremptory strikes. So right. they had the ability, uh, the attorneys in the case, both the defense and prosecution, had the ability to strike people without justifying why. Mm -hmm. So f the past four days, for those who haven't been following, they've been able to strike people, but they've had to explain why so right. for cause and mm -hmm. say hardships in people's lives or uh bias which has been the biggest issue right right too much information mm -hmm. they've seen too much in media they think they know more about this case than they feel comfortable exactly. with them coming into it with exactly yeah. and so how do you kind of whittle that down how do you dwindle it down when so many people know about this case and right. that has been the biggest issue but you know it brings us to today where now we are left with 18 uh, jurors you've got six alternates right. and 10 of the jurors are men eight of the jurors are women we know that we don't know their identities at this time we've not been allowed inside the courtroom we've right. been in an overflow room and you can't see the jurors mm -hmm. and even when we are allowed inside the courtroom we can't have cameras as you've talked about and we're not allowed to show the jurors or talk about them or talk to them mm -hmm. there are a lot of rules around um, identifying who they who they are but going back to who the jurors are it's been difficult because, like I said, we can't see them. But also, there are times where you know they're asked to raise their hand or raise a piece of paper, and they're identified by numbers. So it's difficult to track any of the traits about mm -hmm. these individuals. Um, or what they where they come from, their age, yes, what their occupation is. We just don't know. We that. don't know any of that. Yeah, yeah. Right. but we do know that a lot of them have at least heard something about this case. Mm -hmm. and, and that was something that, that was certainly um, a part of the, surely about the questionnaire, but also as those uh, questions got a little more pointed and a little more mm -hmm. specific as that number got whittled down mm -hmm. you know, to that final 18, um, clearly they want to know, is there a bias there? Or it's not that they can't have heard anything about exactly. the case, but more prosecutors and defense attorneys wanting to make sure that, do they feel comfortable that these men and women can make a decision mm -hmm. uh, based on what they hear in the courtroom and not what they think they know or what they have heard previously. Yes, exactly. And I and I, we talked about this like with multiple defense attorneys as well as prosecutors uh, that we've been leaning on as experts in this case. I asked, you know, is it about who you don't want on the case or is it about who you do want to right. serve on the jury? And they said it's actually both, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, from the prosecutorial side especially, it's ideally it's who they want. Right. But from the defense side, it's more so about who they don't want. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it really is a combination of both and I've had attorneys refer to it as a chess game of sorts I mean it really is a science and it's very very specific and, and there are people I mean there are experts that do just that mm -hmm. I mean, they are are brought into cases to examine jurors um, to sort of kind of read the potential jurors um, to look at you know it's kind of much like a profiler yeah in a, in a criminal case um, yeah, or in point. a you know in a criminal investigation um, it's that that reading of what do we think they're going to do kind of what their thought process might be so mm -hmm. it is you're absolutely right it can be a, a pretty um, extensive uh, a science. You did talk to um, former Eddy County Chief Deputy Prosecutor mm -hmm. Jean Fisher, so gave some insight on why or how that questionnaire that you mentioned mm -hmm. really did help uh, whittle it down, right? Yeah. Let's hear what she had to say about okay. that. All of the really big questions, a lot of the theme questions, a lot of the concerns, I'm sure were addressed in the questionnaire. So when they whittled it down to 42, it definitely made it much um, simpler last night to go through those. They had to do a lot of work to, to get there, but at least they already had their questionnaires for the 42 that they knew were picked. And so I think that probably sped things up quite a bit. 
and having moved the case here to Ada County, um, where we have a much larger jury pool and population. Uh, serving as kind of an expert here and that's exactly what this show is meant to do so we mm -hmm. are going to be able to have the journalists who are there watching this trial and and we're going to allow those you know be able to talk to these experts and so she's not directly connected with this case no but clearly a lot of experience um, in a courtroom a lot of experience with criminal prosecution mm -hmm. understands the process and is going to people like Jane are going to help us um, as we you know as we follow this case day by day um, she's gonna you know be one of those people that we lean on to really kind of help us understand exactly what's happening and and why exactly um, so these 18 jurors we know 12 will be actual mm -hmm. jurors six will be alternates but no one in that pool knows which they are Exactly. And, and Jean talked about that. She said the reason, you know, nobody wants to let them know in advance is because you don't want any juror to be disassociated, to be disinterested throughout the trial. You want them to be paying attention day in and day out, not making any, um, you know, conclusions about the case, not talking to anybody about the case because they don't feel like their duty is as important as an alternate. So they won't know until deliberations, until all the evidence is presented. And I'm sure you know this, Andrea, but Jean was explaining to me, I thought it was fascinating that they'll pull numbers out of a hat yeah. and they'll go okay these are 12 jurors and then if they have to swap anybody out say for example uh, in an unfortunate scenario which is very rare somebody learns something about the case right. and then they you know maybe spread that information to one other person well then they've got to take those two jurors out mm -hmm. of the deliberation and swap them out with alternates at that point Jean told me they have to start deliberations all over again exactly and that so. is something they want to avoid and yeah. that the judge made no, uh, you know, he didn't mix any words here mm -hmm. when we talked about the wanting to make sure that jurors understood their responsibility. We're talking about eight to 10 weeks. This is not a sequestered jury. Mm -mm. Uh, it's not unheard of to have a jury in a case like this have to stay in a hotel room mm -hmm. where everything that they have access to is monitored, everything mm -hmm. from books to magazines to, to TV. Um, that's not the case in, in this trial. And a Clearly, you understand the cost of that is extensive, mm -hmm. um, having to, you know, monitor that and, and make sure. And also is a huge disruption to someone's life. Absolutely. Sitting on a jury is a disruption enough. But yes. to have that be 24-7, uh, certainly something that, that judges are very hesitant to do if they do not have to. However, that also means that the responsibility to, uh, you know, to follow the court order um, has to be followed right. specifically. And so what did he, what was his, what were his instructions? What is he telling him? Yeah, he spoke very candidly. Uh, I wish I had some of it verbatim. I mean, I could find it, but he essentially said, you know, this is your oath. You swore under oath that you were going to follow my instructions. And if you don't follow my instructions, you could be held in contempt of court, right? He said, do not talk to anybody about this case. Do not research it. Do not watch the news, read the news, listen to the news. It, if anything is under your control, don't go about seeking it, right? right? Don't go about asking somebody questions or, you know, mm -hmm. inviting that in a way or seeking something out on TV or in a documentary. Um, if something happens and it's kind of out of their control, he said, if, if something comes on the TV, mute it, mute yeah. it, walk away, you know, because they are not sequestered. And so mm -hmm. he could, however, sequester the jury at any time. Yes. And he said that. Yeah. So that's not out of the question if mm -hmm. any issues arise. Hopefully they do not. Um, but he said he has, he and the attorneys have full confidence in this jury that they will be able to follow instructions. And so I think as a juror, you know, you mm -hmm. go, you go, this is, I know this is a high profile case, right? right? How sure. much pressure are you under? But Jean talked to me actually last week when I interviewed her about the mental health of these jurors too. Yeah, right. And they're going to be seeing mm -hmm. some really horrendous things. I mean, we all are. We actually learned today that the public, whoever's in the courtroom in the overflow room is actually going to be seeing the same evidence that the jurors are going to be seeing mm -hmm. and the judge and the attorneys are going to be seeing. So autopsy photos, some really sensitive material yeah. about kids yeah. and death and the nature in which they were found and the manner and where, you know, and so that is, re that weighs heavily on jurors, which is another reason you've got to have alternates, yeah, right? Exactly. But another reason that you just don't want them talking to anybody about this case. And I also wanted to mention, I forgot to say, uh, going back to the questionnaire, I know this is sort of off topic, but she actually said that this was really fast for mm -hmm. a jury to it be is. selected. Yeah. Whereas I remember this week we were all, oh my goodness, like it's redundant mm -hmm. in voir dire when they're questioning and individually questioning. But this is quick, four days essentially, and then a peremptory strike challenge. Yeah, it it's is. Quick. And it's because, as Jean pointed out, that they had the ability to, I mean, they had a lot of information. And so mm -hmm. they were able to, likely able to kind of immediately weed out 
uh, you know, some immediate concerns. Right. Um, anybody who anybody who was you know close to the case potentially knew um, witnesses or knew you know n- knew more had more access Journalists. to media exactly mm-hmm. had more access to um, information by nature of your job, mm-hmm. um, and and then they got into some of those you know interesting questions and we did talk about that last time about you know understanding circumstantial evidence and could you in fact yeah. be willing to um, you know could you convict or could you believe that somebody did something based on circumstantial evidence and a lot of talk about that also talked about the show csi Mm -hmm. um and you know that something that we certainly uh, think about in criminal investigations you know csi you solve the case in you know 60 seconds 60 minutes minus commercial breaks right right Uh, you you run a test and the lab results you know Mm -hmm. pop up on a screen that's not real life given you have blood or something to show the dna you know Mm -hmm. it matches immediately and so you know they they are able to the fingerprints and all that and that's that's just not how how real investigations work. I mean, it takes uh, months, months and months. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not always conclusive. Um, There are sometimes, you know, questions about uh, and and potentially even some contradictions when Mm -hmm. you look at different pieces of evidence. And, you know, and you talked about the egregious nature of the concealment of these uh, two children. You know, prosecutors have brought that up Mm -hmm. in, in different hearings, and we've talked about that. And so we know that likely um, there will be um, a lot of that information, and potentially, I think that those questions of the jurors definitely point to that. Is yeah. that we may not have definitive. Um, right. This is how um, the you know this is how this person uh, died. died. Yeah, exactly. They're they're sticking by the fact that they believe it was a homicide. Right. Um, they they have said publicly during voir dire during asking the yeah. jurors. Uh, what if we don't know how one of the victims, right. they've said that explicitly, how one of the victims died, would you be able to still find somebody not guilty or guilty of a crime? And, right. um, you know, interestingly, as we've reported, Ballard Dayball is charged with murder, mm-hmm. conspiracy to commit murder, and grand theft. So mm-hmm. she's got multiple charges. You know, if she's not found guilty on one of them, they could drop it to a lesser offense, sure. second degree murder perhaps, or find her guilty on the other one or two offenses. And so I, I think when we talk about circumstantial evidence, it's something that people that aren't involved in the legal system aren't aware of. And that means uh, evidence that has to do with circumstances right. related to a yeah. situation. Um, you know, it's it's text messages leading mm-hmm. up to it. It's yeah. they, they gave the analogy throughout um, questioning of the jurors of a bank robbery. Mm-hmm. So you've got a bank robber, you've got somebody with the gun, you've got somebody with the money bag, you've got the person in the driveway right. car. Is the person in the drive in the getaway car as culpable mm-hmm. as the person who right. pulled the trigger or yeah. who held the gun to the banker's head? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so that's kind of the good analogy, and we heard that over and over again. But that's one way to think about it. And in the modern times that we live in, mm-hmm. like you said, with CSI and Law and Order, all these shows and yeah. um, series on Netflix that we watch, I think the common person. Mm-hmm potential jurors might believe that that's how you have to convict somebody and it's just not true and circumstantial evidence and evidence in general is also witness testimony sure and you can choose whether or not as a juror you want to believe somebody or not sure and you will undoubtedly have you know different perspectives Mm -hmm. different views often of the exact same information Mm -hmm. the exact same evidence different experts um, you know evaluating that differently coming up to a different conclusion and it is up to these jurors to determine what that is and what that really means ultimately in the ultimate outcome of this trial. And, and that's what they are here to do. Beyond a reasonable doubt, yes. is this woman guilty of these charges? Exactly. Right? One yeah. of these charges, all of these charges, none of these charges. That will be up to these 18 people. Uh, 12 of them will make that decision. Right. Um, but 18 of them will sit through this entire, entire case. Yeah, and the state asked, you know, do you understand kind of the fundamental process of how this works, that it is on the state to prove. It is beyond a reasonable doubt, and they have the burden of proof. It's not, the defense doesn't have to prove anything, right? Right. They're here to defend their case. In fact, we'll get to this in a bit, but they don't even have to give opening statements if they don't want to. Right. So um, I, I think... A lot of people, again, going back to the lay person who is a mm-hmm. person called for jury duty, might not know how this works, and they are going to learn. And they've learned throughout this past week, and they are going to learn a lot more next week as well. What about Lori's demeanor this week? Um, what, what have you been able to see? I know access, we've talked about, very, very limited. So um, because of the jury selection you talked about, we want to, you know, the judge was very clear. They mm-hmm. want to protect potential jurors. Um, and uh, certainly if you're not selected and, you know, you want to protect that identity. Um, so no one has been allowed inside mm-hmm. the courtroom, only in that that overflow room mm-hmm. that they're calling it. So very limited kind of, kind of screen access, right? Yeah. And kind of blurry, not super clear. Yeah. Um, so have you been able to tell kind of what her level of engagement has been, what her demeanor has been like? 
let me tell you, it has been very difficult to see because if I could set the scene for you guys, we're in the Ada County Commissioner's room. Mm -hmm. So it's on the main level. It's a large room. There's a lot of seating. That is going to be the overflow room throughout trial. So um, that's the room that I'm personally going to be in so I can do live shots. Um, and in this room, it's dark. There's a big projector in the corner. And in that projector, there's three boxes. And they're live streaming from inside the courtroom, courtroom 400 in the Ada County Courthouse, the biggest courtroom. Mm -hmm. And you can see the judge. You can see Valo and her defense team. And you can see the prosecution. And it is really hard to see. Yeah. Unless you're – even if you're front row, it's hard. I had to put on my glasses because I was like, squint. It's really difficult. But um, – as you get closer, you can see a little bit more. It's tough to follow her demeanor. There were a few notable things this week. She actually at one point, and I don't know if this was the case today, hard to tell, she had a notepad mm -hmm. and was taking notes. Um, you saw her talking to her defense. She's got a, a big defense team. Um, Archibald is her main uh, criminal defense attorney, public defender, and he has a very successful record. Uh, it appears that, you know, she's unknown what their relationship is, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but it appears that she's been able to talk to him back and forth throughout. And um, she's been wearing, you know, we've been reporting on the, what she's wearing, and I know some people aren't a fan of that. I think for us, it's we're the eyes and ears right. in the courtroom. Giving access to, to you know, at least giving you some insight. Something, some insight, right? Yeah. And and for TV people, that's different because we always get our cameras anywhere, you know. Sure. So this is a – it was the judge's decision to not allow um, cameras inside the courtroom or audio recordings either. So anyway, we've been kind of outlining what she's been wearing, and, you know, she always kind of dresses – interestingly differently she has her hair curled she's wearing makeup she's worn glasses a couple days she'll wear a turtleneck and a blazer and a cardigan um and so we've just reported that to to ensure that we're communicating as much as we right. can with people but at one point i saw her and the sketch artist actually captured this i don't know if we can pull up the sketch um it might come up a little bit later but Valo at one point was wiping her eyes or cleaning her glasses. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. And that was when uh, I wasn't personally there, but as my colleagues reported, that was when uh, the charges were being okay. read, I believe. Um, or, you know, something about the nature of the victims in which they were found. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to verify that. But she, yeah, I mean, it's been really, really difficult to see her, and I hope that changes. Mm -hmm. You see her there with her hands folded. Um, the notepad in front of her, that's um, her defense attorney. I just, I hope that moving forward we're able to see a little bit more because it's challenging if you're not inside the courtroom. Right. And, and we know, we, we so appreciate, um, you know, those of you who have commented on, um, you know, asking about different things about her demeanor, different things about, you know, wanting to know a little bit more about this case. And again, that is exactly what this show is, a, is intended to do, mm -hmm. is give you a little bit more of that in-depth look at, you know, the day-to-day, week-by-week uh, happenings inside the courtroom, but but understanding that there will be that challenge throughout this case. Yes. So we simply will not have um, anything short of a sketch. Um, we hope to have audio um, mm -hmm. from from the day's um, hearing, but again, we don't know for sure. We hope to have that each day, but we don't know when we that know. might happen and, and when we will be able to share that. But certainly, um, we will do the, the best we can to bring as much of that detail to you um, as possible, again, with the sketch artist. Then, of course, on the, yeah. the the reporters and um, folks who are who are at the courtroom on the ground. I mean, exactly. that is the only way. What you just saw is the only way we're going to be able to visually depict. And we've got a great sketch artist, Lisa Cheney. She's been in the overflow room with us, uh, drawing these photos. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what she'll do every day. She's there have been days where she's produced five photos for us, and it's been our visuals and how the public can understand what's going on. Um, a lot of media organizations, not everybody, but a lot of media organizations chipped in to pay for this and mm -hmm. so um this is what we're leaning on and she's done a, a really wonderful job we actually did a brenda rodriguez did a story with her this morning about you know her interest in this and so yeah. you guys can watch that on our website by the way so one of the questions that um, was kind of outstanding this week was whether or not jj vallow's grandparents mm. Kay and larry would be allowed inside the courtroom during mm -hmm. the case they actually made a motion to the judge because if you are a witness in a case you are usually not allowed to be in the courtroom. And it makes sense, you know, you, right. you, they worry that um, a witness could hear other testimony, they could hear other information that would potentially even unintentionally skew their own, their own recollection of something mm -hmm. or their own, you know, their own statements. Um, however, uh, you know, Kay and Larry argued they are advocates, that mm -hmm. they are not just witnesses in this case, but that they are victims in this case. So what do we know about their access now? So, 
they got an attorney. They lawyered up last week. Uh, I believe it was last week. And they said, uh, we believe that we are victims and we deserve to sit in every minute of this trial. And they have been very vocal, as, have, yeah. as anybody who's followed this case knows. They have been the ones that we've spoken to, that multiple news outlets have spoken to. So they filed to be, uh, you know, understood as victims. And a judge just ordered, uh, yes, two days ago, it was filed yesterday, that they will be allowed inside the courtroom. Excuse me, uh, Kay yes. Woodcock, the grandmother, will be allowed inside the courtroom. Grandpa of J.J. Vallow, Mm -hmm. Larry Woodcock, will not be allowed inside the courtroom until after he testifies because – so Kay and Larry are both witnesses. Mm -hmm. We're expecting – the witness list is sealed, by the way, and it will remain sealed, we learned. The judge will keep that under seal mostly because of Chad Daybell's trial still to come. So the witness list is sealed, um, but we know – we likely know that they're going to be witnesses and – the judge ruled Kay is a victim. She can sit in. So can Lori Vallow's sister, Summer Shiflet, and Colby Ryan, Vallow's son as her well. Her oldest child. Her oldest child with a different husband. Mm-hmm. And um, and Larry can come after. He just can't be in the courtroom initially until after he testifies. So Colby would be Tylee's older brother mm-hmm. and, and, of course, considered himself J.J.'s older brother as well. Yes. So um, J.J. was adopted by Lori Vallow and her husband at the time, Charles Vallow, who is actually – Charles is actually Kay's – um, brother, brother. Mm-hmm. and so it is a little bit you know it, it's a dynamic in that he was a nephew however right. biologically um, was born to Kay's son mm-hmm. and his wife so um, so they do have a biological uh, you know connection I mean that they right. are his grandparents um, and so the judge ruled ultimately ruled that while they didn't have a motion um, they really didn't have a, a legal reason to to argue to be in the case into the in that courtroom so he really didn't even um, weigh in on the motion but what he did say was that they can appoint an advocate mm. which means she can be the eyes and the ears for that victim who cannot be there themselves right. um, the court does allow for that and so that's where the the sister Lori's sister is mm-hmm. going to be she's considered the advocate for Tylee okay. um, Kay considered the advocate for JJ and mm-hmm. then allowing Colby in didn't add you know didn't add advocacy there but just said that he was allowed to right. be in the case in in, in that victim exactly yes um, in that uh, courtroom and that is really you know I mean that is what um, the law allows you mm-hmm. know I mean it is a an open forum in terms of this is the people's court right um, and and so mm-hmm. these proceedings while they are limited mm-hmm. um, there is a legal um, you know a, a legal reason if you will to to allow for folks to be able to watch and right. understand what's happening you know that's right. the way our court system was designed mm-hmm. and so that really was the argument and now Kay will be able to to be in there and I think that obviously made a, a huge difference oh for that my couple. Gosh. I mean, and you think about it, sometimes, you know, victims aren't afforded the mm-hmm. rights that they always deserve, you know, and sometimes they're just seen as a member of the public and they get things when everybody else gets things. And so I think that um, because they have been so vocal and they have been such strong advocates, um, this is, it's, it's uh, pleasing to see that yeah. they got this, you know. So opening statements. Um, mm-hmm. We know prosecution will make opening statements on Monday. You mentioned defense mm-hmm. does not have to. Do we know if we, do they expect to? We'll see. I, everything in this case is a day mm-hmm. by day situation. I mean, we didn't know when opening statements were going to start. We didn't know when the jury was going to be selected. We thought maybe it would be today. We thought maybe it could be two weeks. So um, the defense has the ability to waive their right to present their opening statement and wait to present their case until they call up their evidence and their witnesses sure. um, and just let the prosecution go first and not show any of their hand, if you will. So uh, we'll see on Monday, I mean, what they decide to do. And again, going back to the whole the whole setup of this is on the prosecution yeah. uh, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, mm-hmm. that Lori is guilty of the charges they're alleging. And so that's where we're going to get that insight into what the strategy will be. I mean, yes. that's really will be the, the first time that the prosecution really lays out that full case and ultimately will tell the jury you know, they will roadmap Mm -hmm. um, what they expect to be able to show and ultimately what they are hoping to be able to prove with what we believe to be as many as 200 witnesses. Wow. Yeah. Um, And, you know, we will not know, as you said, we won't know who those are until they are called. Right. Um, We'll track them. Of course. But interestingly, too, when you think about um, eight weeks, 
That's a long time. So they have a lot of evidence. Both sides have a lot of evidence. A lot of people that they're calling, as I mentioned, witnesses are considered, witness testimony is considered evidence in a case. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that is going to probably take up most of it. You've got cross-examination, you've got redirect, all these sort of legal lingos that the attorneys can go through back and forth. They can call witnesses back. Um, But eight weeks is a long time. And so it's going to be, we're going to learn a lot. And Mm -hmm. I think from, you know, the defense perspective, it'll be interesting to see whether or not they do decide to give any sort of inkling as to what they have on the right. first day. But we do know opening statements are not arguments. Right. No nope. opening statements. They will not be going back and forth. Nope. They will, like you said, simply provide a roadmap, say this is who you're going to hear from. Mm-hmm. This is what we're laying out in our case. This is what we believe happened. Right. And then the jurors go, okay. And again, hope do not make up your mind yet, jurors. That's kind of what they're instructed. Sure. Keep an open mind throughout trial. That's the big thing. Keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll see if the defense does the same. Yeah. And that's, we will be watching that. We will be sharing that with you as well. As you have questions, um, we've already had a couple of people ask, what about the name, right? Lori Vallow or Lori Vallow Daybell. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's make it clear that in the court filing Mm -hmm. and in her booking and on these charges, she is listed first as Lori Vallow, Mm -hmm. right? Lori Noreen Vallow. Yes. So middle name included Lori Noreen Vallow. Um, And then AKA, also known as... Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have used those names uh, interchangeably. However, it is Lori Vallow written, you know, in as that Legal. on that complaint, mm-hmm. exactly, which is why, um, you know, we understand that's the name that, that we have kind of deferred to, um, calling it the Vallow trial and such. But that question did come up. Um, and so both. Both names are listed, but it's an AKA in terms right. of adding that daybell on there. And that's something that we understand. Yeah. Um, the Vallow family, very sensitive to that. So she is no longer yes. married to Charles. In fact, he Charles. was killed. Yes. Um, and so, um, you know, understanding that, and, and certainly that was a question that came up that we wanted to try to answer. If you have other questions that you want us to try to answer, please, you can text those to us. Um, that number here, 208-321-5614, ask that. We will we will try to research what you want to know um, because we do want to take you along with us mm-hmm. um, as we you know, follow this case and hope to bring you that inside, inside the courtroom as things happen. So yeah. Morgan, you will be there and, and yes. we will continue that coverage um, as we move into the next week and the start, really the, a really yes. official start yes. of this trial that will last um, eight to eight. 10 weeks. Yeah. So we'll be learning a lot more and I think that this is a great, a great platform for us to be able to really dive into it and explain the process more. So uh, grateful to be able to have this and uh, you can follow Shira Matsuzawa, Alexandra Duggan and myself on social media as well as all of our coverage on KT KTVB.com, the KTVB Plus app, YouTube, um, and I think I covered them all. We've got a lot of platforms. We will get all of those uh, Mm -hmm. and get all that information to you as we are able to. So thanks so much for being here with us today, and we will see you very soon.